Thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming, everyone that's here tonight. The Rabbani Shalom, before we were even born in this world, the Kaddish Baruch Hu said to us, Borei Olam said to us, you're going to meet X amount of people in the course of your lives, and you're going to have an effect on X amount of people, and they're going to have an effect on you. And that's going to be true when you're in your youth, and it's going to be true in your adolescence, and it's going to be true as a young, uh, young father and a young mother, Bezrat Hashem, by everyone over here. Kind of, uh, for those that weren't already young mothers and young fathers by your children, that's a shame, grandchildren. But at every point in our lives, there are no random appointments. There is a reason that Borei Alam put us there. And the Kaddish Baruch Hu is going to say to us, you be mechazik, the next person, that person is mechazik, the next person, there's a, there's a, there's a very complicated network of chizuk, which is based on each and every one of us doing what we have to do. And the truth is that we see this before we are born. When a baby is in its mother's womb, so there's an angel, there's a malach that comes. And the malach gives the child a flesh. In that flesh, we basically see the entire, we see all of our lives. We see, we see more than that. We say, misofo olam at sofo. What does that mean? From the beginning of the world until the end? That sounds pretty scary. Beginning of the world until the end. It sounds like until Kim Jong-un pulls the button. Ha! Huh? And you believe me when I said we're stopping our nuclear tests. What does that mean till the end of the world? The end of the world, the Chazal say that the baby in the mother's womb sees misofo alam at sofo. It doesn't mean in terms of gloom and doom. It doesn't mean in terms of destruction. It means that the world has a plan. There's a beginning and an end to the world. And as we would understand it, from Har Sinai until Mashiach, until the Beis HaMikdash is built. And there's a plan. And in that plan, we may have strayed, of course. But really, if you believe in Hashgacha, even the straying, of course, is also on course. And we're there, and things have to connect. I was once driving with someone, and he was following one of the navigating programs. And it took us on a, on a side street. It was actually in Etsy Israel, And he said he's convinced, and I have no idea if this is true or not, but I found out that someone actually made that charge. Still don't know if it's true. That some of these naviga na navigating programs, they'll take you a little bit off course, so you pass through certain stores, which those stores pay a commission for, that they want you to see certain advertisements. Again, don't sue me. I have no idea if that's true or not. So I was saying to myself, so you're not going off course. You're going according to course. They're not taking you off course. They have a very precise course for you. It's, you're going off course where you would like to go, and that's the shortest distance between two points. But they have a different cheshbon, why you have to go, why you made a right instead of a left, where if you look at a map, it looks like you could have done a little bit better because they wanted you to drive by certain stores. In, in our lives, sometimes it looks like we're going off course. We have a, what we would imagine we want our life to be. We imagine, you know, as a child, when we're going to get married, and we imagine when we're going to have children, and when we're going to have grandchildren. We have it all figured out until the nursing home, right? But, although most people don't pick their nursing homes when they're young. They say, be nice to your children, because they're the ones that pick your nursing homes. But we kind, of, we kind of have a vision. When we're young, we kind of have a vision for our life. And for very few people, does life follow that vision? And really what, our, what we have to do is to, when we, we believe in Borei Olam and we believe in Hashgacha, it's that we're not off course. There's a reason that the Borei Olam wants us here. So Hagar is wandering around and she's lost. The Torah, the Chumash says she's lost. And Rashi tells us, what does it mean she's lost? That she went after Gelulei Be Sevilla, that she went back to the idol worship of her father's house. How do you know that's what it means? Maybe lost means lost, going north instead of south. Maybe lost means, you know, I-95 north instead of south, which is a very bad mistake to make, being that north takes you to the tip of Maine, and south takes you to the bottom of the Florida Keys. And the answer is, and many of the Mepharshim say it, that in the Torah there's nothing called lost. It can't be lost, because God's vision is over everything. He sees everything. How can you be lost? He knows exactly where you are. It's like a mother puts a child to play in a little yard. And the yard is gated in. 
and the mother is watching, and the kid goes from the sliding pond to the in a little private yard, and the mother is watching from the porch. At one point, the child, the little toddler, may think he or she is lost, but the mother is watching the child the whole time. The mother knows exactly where the child is. Borei Alam knows exactly where we are. He knows where we are physically. He knows where we are emotionally. And sometimes he sends us because he, to different places for reasons that we may or may not understand, that we have to be there. And that's really what I think chizuk with a, with a cue is. Think about how a cue goes, right? It's round, and then it drops down a little bit. And there's even a little thing that comes up, depending on how you, your second grade teacher told you to spell a cue. It's that, are you going to say this is a strange looking circle? I said, no, it's not. It's holding the lollipop. What's a little hook at the bottom? That's to give you a good grip on it. In, 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 in our world, it looks like we're going to go, okay, we're going from here to here. It'll take me this amount of time. Suddenly there's this long stick and we're dropping right through. This wasn't supposed to happen. I was supposed to get a mortgage on my house. This shiduch was supposed to go through. What is going on over here? I was supposed to get this job. My boss liked me. What happened? Why did he tell me one day that, you know, we'd love to have you, but, you know, we can't afford it? What, what happened? It was supposed to be such a beautiful yamtiv, and I sat down to the Seder table. We got into this fight, this meaningless fight. Why? In the second days, I, you know, my, my grandmother said, maybe you find someplace else to spend. You know, we don't want you, but we don't want you. Something like that. Borei Olam knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly where you're supposed to be. And yeah, maybe he does want you in front of a certain store. But it's not off course. The navigating process is not making a mistake. The navigating process knows exactly where it's sending you. Today was, uh, some say, the art center of the mayor Balanes. But I want to go a little bit later. Uh, there was a ra- rabbi in Lodz, Poland. His name was Rabbi Leohu Chaim Meisels, the Lodgerov. And he lived in Poland in a very, very difficult time. He lived in a time where anti-Semitism was taking on a whole new meaning. After World War I, people understood a whole different meaning in anti-Semitism. Until that time, the world really believed that no one hated us, it's just they wanted to convince us to join their religion. The Crusades had nothing to do with hating Jews, it's just they wanted us to see the truth, right? See the whatever. The Spanish Inquisition had nothing to do with hating us as Jews, no, it just had to do with King Ferdinand and they wanted to, uh, Turkadima and all the, you know, they wanted, to, to, they wanted us to see the light, so to speak. So, of course, the, the Haskalah, the Enlightenment said, if we would only drop religion and wouldn't look like a Jew, that would be the end of anti-Semitism. Then a strange thing happened in Europe toward, toward World War I. You had the whole period of the Renaissance. You know, the last thing you want is a history lesson. It's almost as good as grammar. Right? But basically, there was a revolution against religion. So, oh, if there's a revolution against religion, and if the church no longer runs countries, and even in Europe there's some level of separation of church and state, that should be good for Jews, right? That should be the end of hatred to Jews. And suddenly a new kind of hatred swept into the air. Hitler didn't hate Jews for religious reasons. He didn't really have a good reason for hating Jews, other than there was a Jewish doctor that treated his mother or maybe saved him. That often happens when you do someone a favor, he hates you. We often said, uh, I had a grandfather who used to help everyone, helped everybody. And if somebody heard him, he would look to help him. And I heard once, and my grandmother told him, you know, where, where are you going to help that guy? He goes, he didn't do you a favor, we have to go help him, stay home. It's late, it's raining. But be it as it may be, suddenly the religious anti-Semitism, right? In late 1800s, early 1900s was replaced with uh, what kind of an anti-Semitism? I hate you because you're Jewish. It doesn't necessarily have to do with your religion. And I think it was Rothschild who said, Lord Rothschild who said, that it's not my, Rabbi Wine has beautiful shiurim on this that explains it, but basically he said, it's not my religion that you hate, it's my nose that you hate. And the, the Lodgerov lived in this time, anti-Semitism in Poland was beyond imagination. A lot of it had to do with the fact that there was a feudal system that the local landowners ran, basically controlled their territory. There was a very weak federal government in the form of a king. And there was no middle class in Poland. There was the nobility. They rode around on horses and they had these long 
long swords. No one could really figure out why they were so long. And they were the knights, and they had to clunk around in this heavy armor the whole day, which makes you very, very upset because it gets very hot. It did not have any internal air conditioning. And sometimes they ran out of wars, you know, they had to come up with more. So you had the nobility, and you had the peasants. And the peasants worked on the farms for literally pennies. And whatever pennies they made, you know, they spent it in the tavern that was owned by the landowner. When they came home without any money and their wife would yell at them, they would beat up their wives. It was a certain kind of a culture. There was no middle class. The only middle class were the Jews. Jews were not allowed to own land. And Jews were restricted from many of the, many of the ways of making parnassah. One of the ways that Jews made Parnassah was if uh, nobleman A wanted to lend money with interest and nobleman B, you technically weren't allowed to do that. You're not allowed to lend money with interest. But if the Jew is in the middle, you can. And also the noblemen would send the Jews to collect the rent from the peasants. So if the peasant who was paying something like 30 or 40 or 50 or 70 percent interest, you know, the Jew came banging on his door, simply uh, he was getting a pittance but he was working for the noblemen, obviously the hatred to the Jews increased. Then you had World War I where it was unleashed, and we don't understand. World War I is not studied because it's so dwarfed by World War II. 350,000 Jews lost their lives. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying Jews, just human life in general. World War I was an insane war. War just that was going nowhere. No one had the courage to stop it. But there were, there were, there were total Jewish... Jewish uh, little villages throughout Europe that were totally uprooted. And the Jews were th thrusted into the cities after World War I. And there was not enough place for them. And you were in the way. You were in the way of the, of, of, of the regular pole. And they were in the way. They didn't want to be there, but they were in the way. And the anti-Semitism simmered, simmered higher. And here Rebbe Liyah Yechaim is the Rav of Lodz, and it's after World War I, and he's dealing with hundreds of thousands of refugees. And he was a great scholar, a great Talmud Chacham. And at one point in his life, he said, God, listen, I didn't make World War I. I didn't create the political climate. You did. So clearly you want me to do what I have to do. And what he did was, he closed his Gemara, and he closed his Shulchan Arach, and he went out there. And did whatever he could, that the literally hundreds of thousands of, 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 of women, in Rahman al-Islam, Hashem protect us all, that were widows and orphans, had a place to live. And he provided for them from morning to night. And never stopped, and never stopped, and went to the rich, and argued with the government, very often at risk to his own life. So one of the great scholars of that time was Rav Chaim Oizer, who was the Grand Rav of Vilna, no small Baal Chesed in his own right. And he met Rav Eliyahu Chaim. And Rav Chaim Oizer gave him his sefer. He says, this is my scholarly work, the Achiezer. And Rebbe Leo Chaim looked at it, he said, I'll bring you my scholarly work, I'll bring you my work. He said, really, I never heard that you wrote a sefer. Very good, I'd love to see it. He was known to be a great guy. And he came back with six huge bags of receipts, of IOUs, that he owed every single rich Jew in the whole world, because he borrowed money to be able to pay, and he was breaking his back to try to pay it back. He says, what should I tell you? This is my scholarly sefer. The only thing I can tell you is I can almost guarantee you that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of widows and orphans that did not die of hunger because I keep borrowing and selling and borrowing and trying to support and going after people. And Reb Chaim Moiser took the, the bag of receipts and he kissed it. He said, what a safer. And he began to cry. And he said, who knows who's safer, whose work is not going to be more chashuv and shemayim. And I want to tell you, Rabbi Chaim Meiser himself was an unbelievable Balchesed beyond imagination, who he was. He was a man that came to Vilna, where Rabbi Chaim Meiser lived, and he wanted to get into the Jewish hospital. There was a Jewish hospital, which was built because Jews weren't allowed into the other hospital. And they told him, you know, that, that it's hard enough for the, keep, for the doctors to keep up with the workload over here. You can't come from the outside and come in over here. So he began to cry. They told him, if you get a letter from the rabbi, you can come. So it took him a few days. He got to the rabbi's house, and he couldn't get in. He couldn't get into the house. It was blocked. He ran around the back. He was desperate. What doesn't one do for a child? And he ran up the back and jumped in through a back window where Rebbe Chaim Meiser was sitting there and deep in thought by a table. And he looked at him like, what are you doing? Not a good, not in the wrong time zone to be a burglar. You're supposed to do it late at night. He said, Rebbe, I beg of you, please, 
I beg of you, please, you know that story? There's a rabbi who's sitting and learning 3 a.m., and all of a sudden through the skylight he sees two feet dangling, and he sees this guy drops down. He's wearing a ski mask over his face. Unfortunately, his tzitzit was showing also. And he goes, oh, no. He goes, and the, he didn't think the rabbi was up at 3 a.m., and he's holding a sack, and the rabbi takes off the ski mask, and he says, Moshe, how are you? Nice of you to drop in like this. Uh, can I help you? He goes, why are you here? He goes, Rabbi, I, I came because I had a shayla, I had a question. He goes, yeah, what's your question? He goes, how do you get out? <laughs> so Rabbi Chaim Eiser turns around, and this man comes in through the window. And he's there, and he, and, and he says to him, well, what are you doing here? So he says, Rabbi, my son is dying. I need a letter for you to get him into the hospital. Rabbi Chaim Eiser sits down and pens a letter. He asks him, he inquires about the condition of the child. And he pens a very, very complicated and, a letter and gives it to him and says, go. And he says, you know, go out the same way you came in. He doesn't understand why. He jumps back out. He's crawling around. He sees a huge crowd. He says, what's going on over here? Why is there such a huge crowd? Everyone's waiting to see the rabbi. He says, you didn't hear? Today is the funeral. The rabbi's only daughter that passed away. She was 12 years old. And he was sitting over there reflecting on, you know, what, on, on, on the tragedy that just took, took place. And this man climbed in. And instead of telling him whatever he would, any normal person would have told him at that given time, he said, so God sent him over here. God sent him at this moment. Or Chaim Meiser later, they asked him, before the funeral of your daughter, God forbid, no one should be tested. He said to me, to, he viewed it, there was God's nichum avelim. It was God who came to console the mourners. That's how he viewed it. See, you, you see where Rabbi Chaim Meiser saved all the yeshivot. He told them to come to Vilna on his responsibility. And the father was amongst them. And they went from there to Shanghai. And they were rescued and saved. So Rabbi Chaim Meiser was no small Baal Chesed. But he looked at Rabbi Leo Chaim, the rabbi of Lodz. And he looked at his bag of receipts. The way the rabbi came out and said, this is my safer. This is my scholarly work. And Rabbi Chaim Meiser began to cry. And he said, who knows whose safer is Marach Bor Chashuv? Who knows who's safer is more precious in Shemai. So Rebbe Leo Chaim said as follows. It says, Ish kematnas yodoi, kibirkas Hashem elekecha, ashenosan ashenotan lach. So when, when do we say that? We say that in the Shemona Esrei of Musaf. Right? On Yom, on, on, on Yom Tov. Everyone came to Jerusalem. Ish kematnas yodoi. Every person according to whatever he was able to bring. Kibirkas Hashem elekecha, Nasan Lach. Nebel Yochayim said like this. You know how God gives us? He gives us based on our ability to give. There has to be a system, and you have sometimes a heating system. The water comes into the boiler, it has to go out the other side. And if there's a clog and the water is not coming out the other side, the boiler is supposed to shut off automatically. Because if it does not shut off, Rahman al it could explode. God says, I'm willing to give you, I'm willing to give everybody. But in order for me to give you, you have to consider yourself a conduit of bracha, and it goes through you through someone else. And that includes money, it includes menuchat nefesh it includes archavat hadas, it includes simchat hachayim. So Rabbi Leol Chaim taichd, ish kimat nas every person the way he gives, kibirkas Hashem lekech nas that's how Hashem can give you. In a similar vein, the Kedush HaSlevi says, what did the Kohanim say? Ko sevarcha. What's ko? Chaf, hey. Ko, like this. Like this sevarcha. The way you are willing to bench someone else, that's how I am willing to, to bench you. Kohanim, by Birchat Kohanim, so of course you're not supposed to look at the Kohanim, right? Anyone peeked when they were little from underneath the talit? You can tell me the truth. Right? A little bit, right? So if you peeked, then you saw the Kohanim have their hands out like this. They have their fingers, right? but the, the back of their hand, the palm of their hands is toward the front, it's toward the crowd. The back of their hands is toward their faces. Why? So Kedushat Levi, the Helig of Adichava says, because when you're taking, you go like this. So every country has their own salute, right? Some like this, some like this, you know, come give me. When you're taking, you go like this. Please, can I have? Generally, when you're giving, you're, you're going like this. 
So if the Kohen says, I want bracha, give me, give me, give me, 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 that doesn't stimulate bracha. What stimulates bracha? Like this, God, give me so I can pass it on. And that is the source of all bracha. Ko sevarchu. You know, I, I, I spoke today to a very good friend of mine, Alex Goldman, a wonderful, wonderful uh, mental health professional. He was explaining to me, there are people that live from the outside in. They, they, they somehow feel that externally something would be different, my life would be different. If I only had a better car, my life would be different. Ah, if I had a prettier wife, my life would be different. If I had a different husband, my life would be different. If I had, only had a nicer house, if only I had a better job, it doesn't end. And there are some people that live in the inside out. The outside is neutral. But we pray to God, let me be in the mood where I have the patience for the people around me. Because that is the makar hasimcha, right? PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. People go through a trauma. How do you get someone out of a trauma? We, we are all naturally attra attached to our traumatic Tra tra traumatic memories, sorry, I went to Yeshiv. Right? And in our mind, we create psychological experiences. And really, what we want to do is we have to choose where we give our energy to. If a person went through a terrible trauma, a person was walking home at night, and suddenly there were footsteps behind you. Right? I had a friend of mine, lived somewhere in the outskirts of Jerusalem, and an Arab chased him with a knife really chased him with a knife. And he wound up hiding behind some kind of a garbage can. And somehow he, he saved. He saved himself. But the fear was awesome. He said the next couple of weeks went out of his mind. He would walk and he would jump, jump, scream, yell. Every time somebody was behind him, he was petrified out of his wits. So the person that helped him out of it said, look, you're reliving the fear of that moment. Imagine someone's behind you, someone's behind you, and you turn around and all of a sudden there's a guy chasing you with a knife. It's not a very good feeling. You read about it in the papers. You don't want to be there. You want to read about it in the paper the next morning. So he says, good, but every time I walk on the street, I feel the same thing. You know the story? They say two people lived on the Lower East Side. They just moved in. Everyone says Lower East Side, Manhattan, full of crime. Not necessarily true. And this person's, uh, they lived there for a long time. And this guy comes home late at night. His wife says, don't come home so late. And, 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 and he comes home very, very late at night. And as he comes home late at night, he walks in. And he, and he feels somebody's following him in the big apartment building. He's petrified. Someone's following me in this apartment building. And he walks into an elevator. And the guy, the guy walks in behind him in the elevator. And he was once told, you don't turn around. You don't turn around. You don't make eye contact with that person. Because if you make eye contact with that person, you're in trouble. And he's like standing the whole time in the elevator. And he says, OK, it's just my imagination. He doesn't mean me. He's going off someplace else. He doesn't mean me. And you're standing there and you're shivering. And you walk out and he follows you outside. You take one more turn toward your apartment. He takes the turn behind you. One more turn. Maybe till now was a coincidence. But if I turn left, that means he's after me. He turns left, the guy turns left. He says, listen, the best defense is a good offense. And he turns around. Whack! Boom! And his mother-in-law falls to the floor. What did you do? Oops, sorry. Maybe he wanted to do it, but you know, he didn't, didn't really want to do it. He said, I, I, I was coming to you for dinner. To this day, he's apologizing to her. Although the post-trauma of that particular thing, I think that's like, they're using that for, oh, I'm not going to go there. Anyway. But really, he, he, he explained later that he, he, he had this fear of being mugged or robbed and the Arab that was chasing him. And therefore, in his, in, in, in his mind, this is, this is uh, I changed the details a little so we don't identify the person. You can imagine how bad the real details are. But the person that goes through a trauma lives in a terrible, terrible fear. Why? Because in our mind, we play out the whole thing. And what happens is there's a tremendous amount of energy. You know, a person relives a trauma, and all of a sudden, he starts sweating, and his heart starts racing. And all of the, 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 the physical factors that come into play, physiological factors that come into play, are happening as if it's really happening, because, because what we think in our mind is real. And in the Svarim HaKadoshim, it says what you have to do is you have to reverse the energy. You can't just make it disappear. You have to take that energy and say, Borei Olam, okay, I'm not the same person after a certain experience. Let me use the experience to help people. 
Let me use the experience to do something major on behalf of my family. You, have to, you can't just sit back and do nothing. Because then you're going to be a prisoner of your own thoughts. And, and that's what we have to do in life. And, and, and if you go through an experience and we relive it, it can lead to depression, to hopelessness, to self-judgment. The Kohen has to take the, the thing and, and, and send it weiter. Continue it on. Push it further. Always say the story. I read once that there was a young 17-year-old boy. He was interning on a ship off Hawaii and then came Pearl Harbor. And there's a famous, it's written up this through the whole night. He saw horrible things. He saw the Japanese bomb, the American ships. He saw smoke. He saw bodies in the water. He saw people burning and oil. And, and, and the whole night he was ferrying back and forth on a little ship, dragging people, burning people out of the water. And afterwards he was going out of his mind. He, re, he revisioned the whole thing. And a psychiatrist or a therapist told him, how come that night you weren't frightened? How were you able to run back and forth? He said, I didn't have time to think. I had to save people. He said, so who said you should stop saving people? So he joins, he joins an ambulance thing, and, 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 and he goes up the ranks, and he becomes a very serious you know, emergency medical technician, a paramedic. And he says, I had to. I realize I have to continue saving. And we, we have to do that in our own life. We can do that in our own shalom bias. We can do that emotionally to take our lives and to use it for the right thing. And what happens at that point is your life begins to change. You begin to think, and in my mind, I can control things. In my mind, I can change things. I can convert powers to bracha, convert powers to blessing. I remember once. I was sitting on an airplane, and this fellow was sitting next to me. It's always like, you know, great, 16-hour shutaf, you know? Hi. And right away, he came with a bunch of plastic bags that were crinkling and crackling, and I was like, oh, no, no, no. 16 hours. Then he asked the stewardess for a coffee. You know, some people just drink a coffee. Some people, like, slurp. They go, ah, you know, but in your ear. I can't explain it. And I said, I can't, I can't take this. I just can't take sitting next to this person. I'm going out of my mind. Just the way he was sitting, and he took out this bag of potato chip. It was like, every, every bite was a crunch that sent turbulence throughout the flight, you know? Made the cap and put on the seat, water of the seatbelt. Like, the whole plane was like cracking with his potato chips. The way he was eating, and I was like, I gotta go crazy. I can't sit here for 16 hours. And then he looks at me, he says, Rabbi Shachter, you know, as a kid, I used to love to listen to your stories. I still do. It's amazing. It's very interesting. The whole trip, I, I didn't hear him slurp anymore. <laughs> I didn't hear him break the potato chips. I didn't hear anything. W what happened? He must have stopped? Or in my mind, I stopped. Where all of a sudden, the negative energy turned positive. A lot of what goes on in our life is in our own heart. It's, 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 it's in our own mind. It's not in someone else's mind. It's where we are. I remember once... Uh, when we first got married, we lived in an apartment. There was a landlord. He went crazy if the bulb was on. The bulb was on in the hall. He had to close the light in the hall. Your wife's going back and forth with strollers. How much do you think he saved when that light bulb was closed? 90 cents a year? He's going out of his mind. And when we finished, I, 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 I spoke to a rabbi, he had some dispute about he wanted us to fix something that broke in the apartment or whatever. And, and I went to ask a, a rabbi, and the rabbi told me, you know, he's such a broken person. All he sees is darkness. He sees the whole world taking advantage of him. He goes, I know, but I have to live with him. He says, you have to live with him, you're leaving. He says, no. He says, I refuse to pay him. He says, pay him. Buy a big vase of flowers and a card and say, Thank you so much for giving me a home. Giving me a home, you know, if I was late for rent for what? He's a broken person. All he sees is darkness. And I did it. Did he appreciate it? Maybe a little, I don't know. But it changed me. More important than that, it changed the way I am thinking. And when I became a landlord, and I felt like saying, could you close that light? Why? Why? It cost me another $20 a year. Let it be light. And our experiences in life... We can either try to change someone else, or we can try to change ourselves. And that's what the days of Svirat HaOmer are about. The days of Svirat HaOmer are zeroed in on us changing ourselves. Moshe Rabbeinu 
before the days of Matan Torah, it says, Vayisyaldu al mishpachotah. The Moshe Rabbeinu reminded every single person, let me tell you what you dreamt about before you were born. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what your purpose is in life. And all of a sudden, Moshe Rabbeinu set up the, the galim. He set up where everyone had to, to, was situated, around the Bet HaMikdash, around the Mishkan. At first, Moshe said, are the Jews going to accept this, to go where they're supposed to go? Hashem said, I promise you they will. Not only did they accept it, they had their own natural sense, oh, we belong here, you belong here, I belong there. Really? Imagine in a shul, everyone takes their seat. I, 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 I remember once, I came into a shul. There were two old men who were fighting over their seat. It was an old wooden bench. And there was enough space on this bench for 30 people. But I sit here, I sit there. And the, the gabai had to come out with chalk, and he made this line. You could sit till here, you could sit till here, stop fighting. Why? Because they went through their whole lives this way, defending their turf. If we can learn to take that emotion, turn it around, and be mashpia bracha to someone else. So Moshe Rabbeinu had just told every single year, let me tell you why you're down here in this world. Let me tell you why you have to go through your trauma, to be able to convert that trauma to bracha. Let me tell you why you have to meet. And all of a sudden, when Hashem set up the Degalim, everyone ran to it. They had no problem going to where they had to go. It was automatic. It was a natural sense of feeling. Great, this is where I want to be. And eventually, when Mashiach is going to come, we're going to understand this is where we're going to be. And what the days of Svirat Omer is, is it every single day reflects a different emotion in our life. The first week is the week of Chesed, the second week is the week of Gvura, and then there's the intermingling. And really, whatever's going to happen to you throughout the entire year, whatever emotional mix is in your life, we are paving the way through the days of Svirat HaOmer. So the Shabina Rav was one of the great Go'onim of all times. Probably one of the most clever people in the last hundred century, who understood, hundred years, understood what Klal Yisrael is all about. I'll give you an example. Someone showed me a story today. They once came to him, they wanted him to sign a takana that all people in Yerushalayim that buy uh, dirot, that buy apartments for their children, uh, you cannot buy more than a one-bedroom apartment. So he refused to sign on. He said, why? People can't afford the apartments. You know what's going on? People that have children, they can't. He said, you know what's going to happen? People are going to buy two-bedroom apartments like they did till now. But when you come to collect for a poor orphan girl, they're going to say, no, I can't go against Takana and give money for more than a one-bedroom apartment. That's what people are going to use the Takana for. He said, trust me, you can't force it down people's throats. You have to change the person, n not, you, n not build the gate. So the, the Chabina Rav is home one day, and a little boy knocks on his door Shabbat afternoon. Normally you knock on someone's door Shabbat afternoon very lightly that person is sleeping. The children are playing outside. This kid knocks louder, louder, louder. It's like that thing if you don't put on your seat belt, you know, it goes louder, 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 until it drills your ears. And finally the kid goes bang, and the, the rabbi comes running. What's the matter? He goes, Shabbat afternoon, is it an emergency? He goes, no. Then why are you banging on the door? Because you didn't answer when I first banged. He says, did it occur to you that maybe the rabbi is sleeping? Oh, rabbis don't sleep Shabbat afternoon. Okay. So Shabbat Rav said he never went to sleep afterwards, Shabbat afternoon. That's the kid thinks. The kid says, what's the matter? The kid says, I have a big test on Sunday. And Friday, our teacher said, we have a big test. And I said, oh, I can't take the test because my father is not home for Shabbat. And I have no one to study with. So I cannot take the test. I have no one to study with. So the teacher said, this kid was obviously worth his uh, money. So the teacher said, no, it's not an excuse, you have to take the test. But no one to study with you, it's not an excuse. Who should study with me? Go to a rabbi. I don't have a rabbi. Go to the rabbi out of town, I don't care. He knew good and well the teacher said it rhetorically, but he went to the rabbi of the town. My teacher said I should come to the rabbi of the town. So really what this kid needed was a good, I don't want to say what, right? But uh, the Shavina Rav was about to say, you know, little boy, you know good and well it's not what your teacher meant. Go home. And he said to himself two things. He said, first of all, he kind of scanned his life, what he went through in his life. Siberia, you can't imagine, lost children in the war. He said, it never, ever happened 
Never ever happened that someone asked him to learn with him and he said no. And second of all, if I say no to this child now, he's not going to remember when he grows up the circumstances of why I would say no. He's going to remember he asked the rabbi to learn with him. The rabbi said no. So he told, brought the child in, said, we're going to learn. And he learned with him. Yeah, you know how long? Four hours. I think the kid's going to ask the rabbi again to learn with him. When he walked out, he said, I'm going to call your teacher and ask how you did on the test. And the Shabina Rav said, this Gemara that I learned with him, I must have learned as many hairs as there are in my beard. That is how many times I learned this Gemara in my life. But the Chidushim, the insights that I, that I merited in this Gemara, the depth of my understanding, I never had before. You know why? Because I had every reason to say, leave me alone! We all say that sometimes, of course, right? You know when you're on the phone, don't tell anyone, right? You're on the phone, hi, what's doing? And then a family member comes in, he says, excuse me one second, leave me alone! Ah, oh, yeah, what's, you know, we talk a little different to our family on the phone, you know, chas shalom. Not just somebody, maybe, I don't know who, someone, someone does that. Shabina Rav said, I, I wanted to slam the door on him, and I, I said, I can't, I can't. God made this appointment. He's going to grow up. It's going to be different. And that's why I sat down to learn with him. So I said, that kid grew up to be? I have no idea. But the rabbi said, the insights that I had, I never had. Those moments where it's hard for us to connect. Come on, leave me alone now. And we say, God, you made this appointment. Those are moments that open up beracha, Very, very deep within us. We miss it. Most of us miss it. How does it go? The person said to the man who works in City Hall, how many people work, work there? He said about 20%. <clears throat> we, most of us miss our lives. We, we get so angry. We miss the bracha. So I'll conclude with this. It's a great Rav, Rav Braverman, Yerushalayim. His wife, Rabbanit Braverman, is an older woman. She's very sick. She falls into a coma. It looks like it's all over. And suddenly, to the shock of the doctors who wrote her off, and they already summoned Chavra Kedisha, and the family was there, she gets up. And does she get up, for, for years she, she, she was pretty much uh, limited to the wheelchair. Now she was able to kind of get up and move around and start walking around. And life, like, they asked her what happened. And the story goes, it's brought down in the Sefer Mitzvah, the Simcha from Rabbi Zilberstein. She says, you know, I had a dream. Oh, one of those again, huh? Yep, I was up there. I said, your time came, let's go. Years are up. All right, it's up, it's up. She was not a young lady. No, so they said, nah, go back down. What happened? You don't want me? No, no, let me tell you what happened. She goes back to late 1930s. The, there's a pogrom going on. Artillery is firing down on the old Yeshuv in Yerushalayim. And she's having a baby at night. Babies and wars, they don't always coincide their schedules. She's in Shari Tzedek Hospital. And the nurses, doctors running, you can imagine the chaos that's going on. Every once in a while, crash, windows breaking. She's holding her baby. Next to her is a baby, just a baby in a bayonet. In a, not a bayonet, a bassinet. And there's no mother. Where's the mother? The mother had the baby, and as they were transferring her from one room to the other, something exploded on the street, and she was hit by shrapnel. She's fighting for her life. There was no food in Yerushalayim then. There was no baby formula. There was, that baby had very little chance of survival. And Mrs. Braverman said on her own, my own baby, my own nourishment was very limited. I didn't know if I had enough to feed my own baby. But I made a decision right there and then. I said, Borei Olam, if you put this baby next to me, I'm going to nurse both babies. And the doctor said to her, that's very beautiful. You may be endangering your own child. She said, I'm going to nurse both babies. God shouldn't have put the baby next to me there. And she did. And both babies survived. And did the mother. And in Shemayim, they told her, no, no. You gave that baby life. We're giving you life. It doesn't necessarily happen only after 120 years. 
and it doesn't have to happen under such dramatic and trauma. This story happens every single day in our lives. There's someone next to us that we would rather not deal with. And instead, we say, sure, let's do it. You have a minute? Of course. And then there is a bracha that is revealed within us that we could have never even imagined we could possibly attain or reach. Thank you very much. <laughs>